Welcome to the fourth episode of the AI Tomorrow podcast, a bi-weekly podcast from the School of Philosophy, Psychology and Language Sciences at the University of Edinburgh. In each episode, we will be exploring topics related to artificial intelligence, consciousness and AI ethics. I'm your host, Bartlomi Pohorecki, and the following is a conversation with Olivia Gambelin, AI ethicist and founder and CEO of Ethical Intelligence, a company that provides ethics as service to businesses using its worldwide network of renowned interdisciplinary experts. Olivia obtained her master's degree in philosophy with concentration in AI ethics at the University of Edinburgh. During her time in Scotland, Olivia co-founded the Beneficialized Society and completed her dissertation with distinction on the effects of probability on the moral responsibility of autonomous cars. AI Tomorrow podcast is available on all streaming platforms, including YouTube. I hope you enjoy this episode. What does an AI ethicist do? So an AI ethicist is an ethicist who works in the context of artificial intelligence. So I would say I'm first and foremost an ethicist, meaning I am trained to spot the situations in which an ethical or a moral decision needs to be made. I'm also then trained in the frameworks and methodologies for thinking through those decisions. So it's not me coming in saying, here are my values, and you're going to follow them. It's me coming in and saying, here's a situation that values are an important decision, um, are an important factor of that decision, and here's how to work through that decision. Now, the AI ethicist comes into play in the fact that I, you, I do that kind of work in the context of technology in relation to artificial intelligence. And you are the CEO of Ethical Intelligence, a company that, amongst other things, offers ethics as service. Could you explain what exactly does that mean? So ethics as a service is simply the, let me explain it as in terms of, it is the process of bringing ethical expertise to companies um, through internet access. So for us at Ethical Intelligence, what that means is we have something called an EI ethics board, which is your outsourced AI ethics board. We pull together groups of experts based on the company's needs that can be consulted with as you would your own board of ethicists. Um, so that idea is you can access that board of expertise, your, your ethicists at any, any point in time through a simple means of communication. So it's like 24 seven access to ethics expertise. And so that is one example of bringing ethics as a service to life, meaning we're bringing ethics, the, the expertise, the ability to walk through these decisions, the, um, the different methodologies and frameworks to the client through internet access. I know it sounds really simple when it boils down that way but it really is being able to bring that methodology to life, bring the expertise in into companies where, where it needs to be. Ethics is a vast field with many different views present. So how, how exactly is it possible to distill that framework that you can rigidly use to assess a certain algorithm? So one of the interesting parts of it is we can have frameworks, but they're not, they need to be a bit flexible. Um, we can never have a full rigid framework. Otherwise, it will miss a lot of the nuances that happens in ethics. So when we're developing my company, when we're developing frameworks, what we're doing is we're looking at what questions need to be asked when. And that's with the idea of as long as we bring in the perspective through questions, as long as we bring in the perspective and some guidance through these questions and metrics and sometimes um, different functions as well, um, what we're doing is we're bringing to life within the company basically a mini discussions that need to happen around these challenges. For example, when we're working with companies, oftentimes we're working on current issues and current challenges, but three months from now, they could be facing a completely different challenge. So when we've designed a framework for them, it's more important for us to design a framework that allows them to focus and understand the challenges they're facing and work through it together, rather than a framework that was built for a specific challenge. It has to have that flexibility in it. Um, which can often be, it, it, it's, it's not an easy feat, but it is possible. Would you say that when you design such framework, is it also important to take into consideration the views that the company has, or is it just always you clashing with the company? So we actually never really clash with the company. We actually don't bring in our own views. What we do is we come in and we, we distill what are the company values? What are, what are the current regulations in the space? for whatever, you know, whatever technology that company is developing. And we look at what are the societal values that that company is functioning within. And by looking at those values, um, we will provide research and feedback on the values to say, for example, say one of the values was 
um, something like to have fun. We're like, okay, that's, that's cool. But maybe we can actually push that a bit further. And really what you want to be saying is well-being of your employees. That's, that's a stronger value. In that way, we'll provide research and feedback on values. We won't actually say you need to have this value. Um, and then what we do is we actually advise off of those values. So we're never coming in and clashing with companies. Um, we were trying to work alongside companies for them to better understand their own values and how those work. There are a few instances, though, when we can, we'll come into a company and, and see, well, this is the company's clashing with societal values or the, the company's clashing with um, what their user base is calling for. Those are the clashes that we deal with and try and help companies work through. Um, that, those are the instances where we're saying, for example, look, you're not respecting the privacy of your users and that's something that your users value. And so you need to, you need to make these, these adjustments to be able to meet your users' needs, essentially. You also mentioned just now that you have to take into consideration the societal values. And this perhaps is maybe not easy, but it is doable uh, to the extent that we, I believe that we understand quite well the values that the, the society we grew up in holds. But let's say you would, be, you would have to work with a company from a country that doesn't share necessarily Western values regarding certain things. How is that possible to to take into account those different cultural approaches to AI ethics that are possibly quite foreign to, 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 to us. Yeah. So what we do is when we work with clients, we, we ensure that at least one of our experts on the project comes from the culture, the same culture and society that our client comes from. And they become kind of like the, the culture voice within the group. So for example, we bring together these groups of experts hand selected for a client. We always have someone coming from an artificial artificial intelligence background, someone from an ethics background, um, and someone from an industry, from the industry background. We also make sure that one of those three experts comes from the culture of our client. And for us, that's really important because, for example, if we're mainly Western-based on the project, but our client is based out of, um, say, Africa or um, a, a Southeastern, a Southeast Asian country, then what we need is actually that perspective, that cultural perspective. And so we make sure that we have an expert on that team that's able to give voice to that culture to ensure, okay, we're not bringing in, we're not, in, we're not forcing Western values on a company that doesn't function and doesn't work in, in the context of Western culture either. Is there much difference between the European and American approaches to AI ethics? Because it seems like this is all the West, but I, I, I would assume as you've worked with with, with companies from, from both continents, you, you, you know a couple of differences. Yeah, one of the biggest differences that I see, and, and you're right, I've, I've worked in, in the EU and I've worked in, in the States. Uh, currently today, I'm in San Francisco, so I'm, I'm speaking from the American perspective today. Um, but one of the big differences that I see between the two is Europeans have a more communal approach to things. So for them, they're much more willing to share data in the context of this will help the group. Um, they're much more willing to create regulations and governance around this because it helps the group. It's much more of a communal perspective to how can we all benefit from AI rather than just a few individuals, where the American perspective is uh, a lot more individualistic. You have Americans coming in saying, well, I'm going to create this tool to benefit myself. So it's more of the individual first. Privacy has a much bigger, and because of that, privacy is a much bigger issue out in the States because it's your individual privacy. Those, that's your individual value that you are um, in unwillingly giving away in some cases. So it's, it's interesting. You see it play out in many different contexts, but the biggest difference between the European and American approach to things is Europeans are much more communal and Americans are much more individualistic. In your paper titled Brave, What It Means to Be an AI Ethicist, published in the AI and Ethics Journal, you wrote, I quote, ethical principles do not function as precise facts by which actions can be mathematically deduced. Could you expand on that? Yeah, so essentially what that means is ethics is not something that is captured in ones and zeros or in mathematical equations. Um, different aspects of ethics can show up in data. For example, um, a great, well, actually a great example of this is MIT, MIT had something called the moral machine out. I, I believe it's actually still live as well, but MIT had this thing called a, the moral machine where you would go on 
and you could play a little simulation of the self-driving car where you are the self-driving car and you're making a decision and you're either going to run over like a grandmother or a cat or like five kids. Um, and what that started to do was calculate, literally turn, turn that ethical decision into, into numbers about probability of people choosing different aspects. Um, so that you can start to find patterns of people from different, different demographics, um, how they would choose usually the probability of um, them choosing who to run over in that situation. That you can kind of deduce down to something a little more algorithmic um, mathematical equations there. But however, what's happening there is you're missing a lot of the nuances, a lot of the emotional and intu intuitive input that's going on from the person's perspective. So yes, I may be making um, a decision that you can predict a couple times over, but really you're missing the emotions and the thought that's going behind that. Um, ethics, again, ethics is not something that is necessarily solidified instance over instance over instance. It's very contextually heavy at times. So you need to have the flexibility that when you're automating something through an algorithm doesn't necessarily allow you to have. Would you say it's possible to, to somehow establish a philosophical framework which would somehow quantify emotions and, and, and for that to be able to be used in such situations? Or is it so individual in terms of emotional input that it's just always a job to, 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 to find out by yourself? Yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I don't do too much in terms of emotional philosophy or psychology. Um, I do work a lot with moral emotions and imagination um, and intuition, which, which is where this, this whole aspect of emotions comes into play. I'm sure you can start to understand. Uh, I'm sure that there is the possibility to have a type of framework that could at least begin to bring to light what kind of emotions come into play in these decisions, um, how those emotions, what weight we give those emotions that I think is either too individualistic or so far out um, in terms of our ability to understand. We're, we're still trying to understand where emotions come from in the first place. Um, so it's, it's would definitely be an interesting area of research though, to dive into about what, what emotions and what weight we give those emotions go into these, these ethical decisions. And you also wrote that big part of a job of an AI ethicist that is often, often not discussed is, is being able to listen and being able to, to be very empathetic. Could you expand on that? Yeah, so I often joke with my clients that I am part therapist and part translator. The translator comes into play when I am communicating between industry and academics and then programmers and philosophers uh, trying to give everyone a common language to speak through. The therapist, though, comes with the listening where really people have these questions that they're, that they're sitting with. They have these challenges. And sometimes you just need to sit and listen to them as they're speaking and try and listen for the points that are important to them. So I'll hear clients talking about an issue. And sometimes it's not really the issue that that's bothering them, but it's, it's a few questions that they have going on in the background that they keep bringing up over and over and over again. And if I sit there listening, I'll start to hear those questions over and over and over again. And what I'll do is, and I'll say, I'll say, well, I think, I think what, what you're stuck on is actually this, um, this aspect, let's talk about that further. And so it's, it's very important to be able to not come in and say, here are the values and here's how it works. It's coming in and saying, well, tell me, walk me through the process. How are you making this decision? Um, what's not sitting right with you? What do you feel proud of? Uh, and what can, what, what do you feel like needs to be strengthened? That's where you start. Not, not, not me coming in, telling you what, what you need to do better. It's really me listening to the client about what they, what direction they want to work in. What would you say are the current biggest challenges in AI ethics? I would say that one of the biggest challenges is actually a, cre a clear career path. Again, this is a new developing field. Um, I see a lot of young students and young minds, young brilliant minds wanting to get into this space. Um, we don't currently have, say, a very clear set career path. I have people ask me for career advice all the time and I say, well, I, I didn't see a, a clear career path, so I started a company to be able to do this. Now we're seeing more positions open up, but it's still, there's still a lot of debate around, well, 
does the, is this a person an ethicist? What kind of credentials do you need? What background do you need to come from? Um, what kind of positions are available? What, what responsibilities are, are connected to those positions? There's a lot of questions going on there. So I think in, in so much as we're starting to establish what an AR ethicist looks like in industry, what uh, even a department for ethics looks like in industry, that's one of the biggest challenges that we're facing right now. Just making this something credible and solid, legitimate that, that is, you can go from one company to another and you can expect to find the ethicists in every single company. Um, that's a huge challenge that we're, that we're facing and slowly but surely winning, which is exciting. Ethics is a vast field with many different views present. And when you study ethics at the university, you get to know many different approaches to ethics, which often go against each other. You mentioned that you have you have a specific ways to 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 work with uh, ethics. For example, you take into consideration societal values, but taking it purely philosophically, do you study at your company certain philosophers? Do you do you, do you, for example, mm. try to try to analyze certain perhaps past philosophical arguments regarding ethics? Uh, we don't quote ancient philosoph philosophers. We will use some of their theories and their frameworks to have and center our discussions. So for example, if we're working with a client, we're trying to figure out where their decision's coming from, we'll try and distill down, well, are they taking more of a utilitarian, a deontological, a virtue um, perspective? What, what tends to be their decision-making pattern? And then from there, work with them on that. Um, we don't really go into, into depth of sitting down and going, well, this this, this client aligns with this philosopher um, and try and dive in from there. I can say that I myself, I'm a virtue ethicist. I, I, I tend to subscribe to the school of thought around virtue ethics, um, but that's my own personal perspective. And so I'll, I'll, I'll be very communicative about that too with clients. Of, this is my perspective of how I approach things. Um, and if that aligns with what the client, with the client, with what the client's approach is, then um, that's great. If sometimes, if not, and the client is a more utilitarian approach, I go, okay, great, that's fine. Let's work with that. Um, but we, uh, philosophy and the school of ethics, it's, it's a beautiful field and it's fascinating. Um, but I think one of the, for me, one of the coolest things about philosophy is, is it doesn't really matter the facts. You don't, it doesn't really matter what philosopher said what at the end of the day, when you're coming to apply it. What matters is the thought process they went through and the critical thinking they went through. And so when you're studying philosophy and you're studying all these theories, what you're doing is you're training your mind to critically think. And that's what's important when it comes to applying ethics in the field. The way I view the ethics field, perhaps I'm wrong, so it'd be great if you could correct me, but I see there, there, I see three main paths into, into trying to better the world. So the first path would be educating the public in order to create pressure on the governments and companies. The second path would be working with the government directly to try to establish certain policies. And then the third path is working with companies. Would you say there are other, there are other ways to further the, the field of AI ethics? No, that's, I would say that's a pretty good summary. Um, one of the biggest things is digital liter literacy, what you were talking about, educating the public. A lot of people, it's hard to have feedback and it's hard to feel empowered and to, to, to communicate what you want and what you need in terms of your technology when you don't understand the technology in the first place. So public education is really important. Having that digital literacy, having, having a public that is able to communicate, hey, I don't like this technology and I, I, I want it this way. Um, so moving beyond, we often can get stuck in this, this black hole where a you know, programmer will say it's too complicated, you can't understand it. That's not true, you can explain anything. Um, and so breaking down those barriers for the general public is, is incredibly helpful. Having the government working with the government and creating policies and regulations to help support all of this establishes a great baseline. Um, although it's only a baseline when it comes to ethics. I had a friend say once that if you're compliant, you're one step above illegal, which is true. Um, it's not that you're necessarily ethical, but you, at least you have a good base set. Um, and then working directly with companies, the ones that are actually developing this technology is incredibly important to understand use cases of technology and use cases of ethics in actual business and, and, and tech um, development. So those, I would say, yes, that was a good summary of the three of those um, are really the pillars of 
of what's going to build up a, a strong, responsible tech ecosystem. And if I'm correct, you've worked in all three of those fields, right? You've worked with the governments, you've worked with companies, and you've also uh, recently launched uh, an educational series uh, for your company called The Equation. Could you could you explain what what exactly is that? Yeah, so we have worked uh, we've worked a bit on Scotland's AI strategy. Um, so for the government perspective, we worked we've worked uh, with different different government policies, helping with the back end of communicating. Well, this is this is how it works in business. Um, being able to have a voice there, we primarily work directly with companies and organizations. Um, and then the equation, which is a little more about that public education. The equation is a quarterly magazine. Um, each quarter comes out with a new business case. So our first issue, we were focusing on ethics as a service. Our second issue coming out in January, we're focusing on smart home technology. Um, and what this is allowing us to do is both explain the technology so that it's simple for people to understand, uh, but have a 300, a 360 view, a, a full view picture and understanding. Um, and then it also dives into, well, this is how ethics applies to that piece of technology. This is what it looks like in action. Um, so that's definitely a focus on more of a public awareness and general industry awareness of how ethics is applying into these specific pieces of technology. But you primarily work with companies. Is that a conscious choice that you personally believe that this is the way to, to better the world and to enhance the field of AI ethics? Or is that is that perhaps based on the fact that maybe the governments are not as interested because they, they don't necessarily face, they do face public scrutiny, but not in the same way a private company would if they if they released an algorithm that would do something? Yeah, for us, it's the decision to work primarily with companies is mainly they need the help. Government has a lot of resources. Uh, there are a lot of efforts going on there and we'll help when we can, but really what we're doing is providing a voice for industry into, into government. Um, when it comes to working with companies, that decision is because there are people, there are really good people working on technology that have really difficult questions and really difficult challenges that they're facing. And they're the ones that, you know, they're making the, the decisions about the technology that trickles down and affects all of, all of us. And so if we can help support them and help support these good people in making strong decisions and creating that technology, it has a ripple effect. Um, so for us working directly with those companies and helping them work through these challenges is it's well, first of all, it's, it's the most, those are the most fascinating projects for us. But then second of all, it's where we see the biggest impact for our work. What are your predictions for biggest challenges in AI ethics in upcoming years? As more and more regulation comes out, which is good, we do need regulation, we do need policies. Uh, the relationship between regulation and ethics is going to be really interesting. Um, and perhaps a bit of a challenge of just understanding that, yes, you can have a baseline of regulation and not over-regulation, because if you over-regulate, then that does get in the way of actually creating strong technology and innovative technology. Regulation will get in the way, not ethics. Um, and so being able to figure out how to find that balance where regulation makes sure that everything has a good, strong foundation and then requires, let's say, having an ethicist employed or having some type of eth ethicist consultant, um, something that, keep, that ensures that ethics is being considered in the company, but isn't regulating exactly how it's done. Um, that I think is going to be a big challenge of understanding that balance. So giving enough flexibility to companies, allowing them still the, the ability to innovate and be creative, but giving them the guidelines, uh, that is needed in terms of doing it ethically. That's, that's going to be a pretty big challenge in, in the next few years. <laughs> Currently, some some of the biggest companies have an ethics board already. So, for example, if I'm correct, Google has a has 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 quite a big board of ethics. But there's been some recent revelations about 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 issues there. That, for example, some of the some of the voices weren't being heard properly. So, do you have a certain idea how it could be done to ensure that once the company has such board or has such a voice? it would be properly heard and not just used to, to, I'm not sure if the term is whitewash, but just to, just to, just to, you know, to say we have them and not really let them, for example, do research, but not really take into consideration what they have to say, because arguably the biggest corporations are not necessarily mitigating the, 
the usage of machine learning algorithms enough, despite having a very strong body of research present. So how exactly would you say we can ensure that having such board directly relates to, 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 to effects? No, uh, it's called blue washing, by the way, when you okay. say you do all these ethics things, but you don't actually do them. Yeah, that's, that's a uh, blue washing. And that's an, that's an important issue because yes, you can have an ethics board, but if you're actually it, having an ethics board is a, is a checkbox activity. Cool. You have it, but are you actually doing anything with it is the big question. What that means is actually supplying either your ethics teams, your ethicists, your, your board with a budget to work with and authority to make decisions. So instead of it being attached and uh, attached to a department that you kind of push to the side um, or a, uh, for example, putting an ethicist on a data science team and not giving the ethicist the ability to to work with the data scientists and the authority to bring in decisions for the data scientists, um, that's just going to stunt it. You're not gonna get anywhere. So for example, as well, if you're doing research, make sure you have a process in place to actually carry out that research rather than just having it done and going, cool, this exists now. Um, that's putting a lot of ownership on the companies actually. That's putting a lot of responsibility on leadership within companies to actually follow through on what they're doing. So you're saying that if I, if, if I understand you correctly, that the way to go in the upcoming years is to have companies, make companies have such boards, but also make sure that there is certain regulation that gives the authority to those boards that they can, they can have enough power at the company to, to, to change such, certain things. Yeah, this is where we see, uh, like I was talking about the relationship and the balance between regulation and ethics come into play. In terms of regulation, you can require all companies to have an ethics board. You can't require them to do anything with the board, though. So as long as they prove that they have an ethics board, great, they're using it. Um, you can't really regulate anything beyond that. That's where ethics comes into play, where you're actually bringing in saying, okay, we, we, we have, we've done that checkbox, we have the board. Now, how do we actually employ this ethic? Like, how do we actually put ethics into action instead of just saying, we have the board, we're done with it? Um, does the board actually have a, a voice, a significant voice within the company? Do they have authority? Do they have a budget? That really still depends on the company. So there are there will be companies that have a board that they don't use. That's just fact, unfortunately. Um, but that's when that's when the company starts making, let's say, poor decisions around their technology. And when the there's a triple the trickle down effect where users will see that they will know they will, they will be able, it's very easy for a user to see, okay, this company says they have an ethics board, but they don't actually do anything. Um, I'm not seeing any of that, that impact on, on the technology that I'm face interfacing with. Uh, and then what happens there is then the market starts to talk back, so to speak. So users choose a different product that from a company where they can trust, um, where they can see that the, uh, the company is respectful towards the users. Um, so it, it's, you can't require a company to put authority and budget behind um, an, a, an ethics board or ethicist or, or an ethics team. However, the companies that don't won't be around five, 10 years from now. So is your vision of the future optimistic or pessimistic in terms of AI ethics? It's actually very optimistic, which I know sounds kind of counterintuitive considering I just talked a bunch about the risk and, and the challenges. Um, but I'm actually very optimistic. You know, I, I've been in this field for a while now, and I remember back when I first got into it where I would say, I, well, I'm an ethicist, I'm a trained ethicist, I'm working, working in, in AI, and people give me this funny look of like, what do you mean? How do you do that? What is that? I don't get that. Um, now, when I tell people I'm an ethicist, they go, that's really cool. Tell me more here. Like, can you help me walk through this, this, this story or, or this example, or, Hey, I was hurt. I heard my friend talk about that the other day. Um, so it's a much more common discussion. And what we're also seeing is more and more companies coming to us saying, look, we want to do this right. We see the benefit that we, we see the benefit that comes along with bringing ethics um, into action in a company. And by benefit, I mean, it, there, there is a monetary benefit to bringing ethics into it and in, into, into action in your company. Uh, but even beyond that monetary benefit, clients coming in saying, we, we want to do right by our users. We want to do right by our employees. Um, we're, we're creating good tech and we want to make sure that, that we're following through on what we're saying. In AI ethics, from what I've seen, that students mainly choose two paths. And one path is to focus on 
the existential risks from potential ex- singularity and the explosion of superintelligence. And the and the second path is the path of, which is usually regarded as the the, the more reasonable path, to actually work and try to mitigate the 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 negative effects of of usage of machine algorithms now and and what is happening currently but there's lots of there's a lot of scholars that choose to choose to focus primarily on 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 the potential singularity so could you could you could you could you tell me if you've ever thought about going the path when you were a student or do you, do you think that this is a, a feasible thing to worry about yeah, so this is a great example of there's a difference between an industry AI ethicist and an academic in, uh, an academic AI ethicist. An academic AI ethicist focuses more on those existential questions, where it's bigger bigger research, bigger long term questions that they're that they're grappling with. Um, they're trying to understand really some complex theories and ethics uh, and uh, apply them to our technology. Um, itself. So I actually still pull on a lot of that research myself. I keep up to date with it. I study it. Um, I try and understand the different thinking there. However, that's that's an academic. That that's more. That's primarily more an academic um, AI ethicist work, where they're looking at those bigger pictures. The industry AI ethicist is the one um, that is working directly in in contact with the algorithms, in contact with the companies, to try and mitigate different risks and and help with those decisions. So my decision was to be more industry focused. So I. I, I in practice, I am much more hands-on with my work, although the more existential questions still, I, I still keep up on those because there, there are times where interesting information or perspectives will come out of it that will help me in my in my work on the more detailed, um, on the more detailed industry focused side. So it's there, they are very separate. Um, they can be very separate, although they have strong influence on each other. When you were a student at the Edinburgh University, you created the Beneficial AI Society. Could you say why did you find it important to, to do such thing? Yeah, so I co-founded it with a friend. She was doing an AI, um, a master's in AI. And we had sat down a couple of times for coffee and talked about AI. She was doing AI, I was doing ethics. And it was a fun discussion to hear the other person's perspective. And I remember one day we're sitting down and we're going, well, we find this fun. Maybe we kind of had other discussions with other friends. Maybe we should try and make this a group. And that group became the Beneficial AI Society, where we're pulling together people from her her program in AI and my program from um, PPLS and, and philosophy and, and ethics. And we were pulling together all these different perspectives. And that's that's really where the, the society came from, was, was this desire to be able to talk with someone with a different perspective. Did you find that the events were very popular? Yeah, by the end, we actually had a pretty good following. They, they were really fun. We had a primarily master's and PhD students coming, um, but it was a great time. We had some great discussions through it. Uh, one last question. Is AI going to kill us all? <laughs> Is AI going to kill us all? No, if anything, we're going to kill ourselves. Um, AI is a tool, is a human tool. We can use it either for good or for bad or however we choose. Um, I'm hoping as we go forward that we become more conscious and aware of how we're using and creating this tool. Um, but again, we're, we're still in control here at the end of the day. Thank you for listening to this conversation. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider to like, subscribe, and share.